In this video, we will be looking at DOS for Fun, which is a challenge from Ponable.kr. This is a so-called grotesque challenge worth 444 points. So the overview of the challenge, if you don't want to go through the whole thing, is essentially it's an MS DOS executable that is running on DOS EMU uh, in a Unix or Linux-based uh, server. Um, it has a stack buffer overflow vulnerability, which we'll see. And to exploit it, we'll write snippets of shellcode to um, read and print the flag. So the first text, obviously, is to reverse engineer the binary. Um, and in this case, I'll use IDA. So here, uh, running strings on the binary, we can see that there is uh, this, one, this string here. This is Borland C++, copyright 1991, Borland International. So this is, uh, Borland C++ is a C++ compiler. Um, and in particular, it was a compiler that had a version for 16-bit DOS. And so actually, IDA recognizes this, um, uh, the signatures from this compiler. Uh, and if you apply BC31RTD in IDA, you'll be able to have a, um, you'll be able to identify what the library functions are. And this, of course, makes it so much easier to look through um, the binary. So at the program initialization, we have uh, we have that the interrupt handlers are hooked. So in other words, it swaps out some of the um, default interrupts with its own, for example, divide by zero. Uh, and this is, of course, just to, for example, like print an error message if there happens to be divide by zero somewhere in the code. The segment addresses are initialized, um, in particular, they're changed from what they originally are at the start of the program. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we have a call to int 21 with argument for A. So um, this here is the DOS API for adjusting the memory size. So the way that DOS usually gives memory to programs is that once you load a program in command, uh, com, it will give the entire memory, available memory space to that program, which obviously is not desirable, uh, especially if you want the program to uh, execute other programs. So this just kind of reduces the size of that memory block. And importantly, the stack segment here is made co concurrent with the data segment and the extra segment. In other words, the data stack and extra segments are all pointing to the same thing, in particular, they're pointing to the 64K uh, memory region that starts with the, um, the data uh, that is mapped from the binary. So let's look at main. Uh, here's a snapshot of main. Uh, as you can see, I've already named some of the functions here, in particular, this one here, Volm. But um, essentially what happens first is we have a prompt here uh, that prompts us, actually this, uh, I don't know why it didn't display, but um, this basically prompts for user ID. You also see this if you run the binary. And you're going to input a string, and then it will compare the string to, in this case, capture the flag. Um, so if you get that correct, uh, then we'll proceed. Otherwise, you're going to return immediately. And down here is the return. So pretty uninteresting at this point. Um, here we can see uh, that if we enter the first function call in main, read serials, you are prompted to enter 25 serial numbers, and there's a scanf, and it stores them in a buffer located on the uh, in the uh, data segment. And then these values are written to a file using uh, fwrite, so as you can see here. And the file name is keys, and if you run the binary, you'll see that, that, key, that this file is, is generated. Then this file is opened back up into memory, and each byte is XORed with hex FF, as you can see in this block here. And what that does is essentially just flip all the bits of each byte, uh, as you can show, uh, because the XOR between 1 and, uh, and either 0 or 1 just gives the opposite. And the results are written back to the file at the end here, as you can see. And then, of course, we have a nice message here that says that cookies are encrypted. Finally, the, our input is checked by opening this file one last time. 
in memory, and and then checking every pair um, of consecutive bytes, or sorry, consecutive words, and doing an unsigned comparison between them. And and it must be true that the first argument should be strictly um, has to be strictly below the second argument to continue with the check and eventually return true. Uh, in addition, the last and the first values are also compared in such a manner. So as we can see, there's actually no way to defeat this checker. Every time we'll end up getting an invalid key. OK, so how do we exploit this service? So as usual, we proceed by looking at all the places where we supply input, because our inputs essentially provide the control we need for the exploit. So the first scanf that reads the password is actually saved. If we go back to it here in main, we can see that the scanf target is a buffer S1. I didn't display it here, but S1 is actually uh, at minus hex 40. So in other words, um, 64 bytes below the save base pointer which is fine because as you can see here, um, uh, it reads right up to that point, but it doesn't read past that point. So if there is a vulnerability, it must be in the bottom part here where we input the serial numbers, right? And here is where I've shown a little graph here about how the serial numbers, the data from the serial numbers gets passed around uh, from memory and disk. So you can see the left side here represents memory, the right side represents uh, writes to disk files. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look. Um, in the final step of this data flow here, uh, we have a load into BP minus 50, which is exactly 25 words uh, below the save BP of that frame, right? Uh, that's BP minus 50. Um, but we notice here that the third and the fourth blocks, here's three and here's four, these don't really change the size of our file, right? Initially, our uh, our data essentially should be, it should be 50 bytes, but if it's not, then this won't change it anymore. And if it is, it won't, it won't make it any larger. It's just a uh, byte-wise inversion. It's not going to change the size. So the vulnerability must be in this first part here where we read and write to that file. And indeed, we find that this is the case. Uh, in particular, if we enter a, a line feed, in other words, hex 10, or, or sorry, hex A, which is decimal 10, the uh, F write function will graciously insert a carriage return as well. So this is, uh, this is decimal 13, which is hex D. And essentially what this does is positions the cursor at the start of the, uh, of the line. You can think about this kind of in context of a typewriter, right? When you want to advance the line, what you need to do uh, it first is obviously uh, move the page up, right? Or in other words, move the cursor down on the page. And then you need to move your cursor from that current location in the X direction to the very left, right? And that's, um, that's the carriage return. Uh, and in Windows, this is how the new line is implemented, right? And um, in other words, the new line is two characters. So actually what happens is if we just input A, or in other words, input 10, and we write to the file keys in that manner, we're actually going to end up writing an additional byte. So instead of one word, we get one and a half or three bytes, uh, one and a half words or three bytes. And obviously this presents a problem to us because uh, of the fact that we're loading into BP, exactly BP minus 50 in this lower step here, so if we make our data too, um, too big here, we are going to get an overflow um, when we load into the checker function. So let's go ahead and demo this uh, buffer overflow vulnerability. What we're going to do is we obviously know that this checker here, I've called it vuln, but this is the checker. We know that it's always going to return false. In other words, we're always going to go in this direction. So to show that we can we have uh, execution code execution uh, abilities, what we're going to do is redirect the execution to this block here. I'll print out, wow, how did you manage to get here? So to craft this exploit, it's very simple. We just need to overflow the save BP and then simply overwrite the return address. 
But remember, this is a 16-bit machine, so when we say overflow to save VP, it's actually not 32 bits, or in other words, four bytes, it will only be two bytes, or one word, and so will the return address. And the location here is hex 5 d 5 So this is what we're going to overflow the return address with. So here's our payload. Um, this is the start of the buffer, and this is the end of the buffer, or at least what is supposed to be the end of the buffer. And what we're gonna do is uh, overflow this, as well as this, this is the save BP. We don't really care what we put there. Um, and then we're gonna overwrite the return address with 5d5. So this is very similar to uh, what we've seen before. Now notice that it's not necessary to specify the segment, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well, because this is a relative or a short return. It's an inter-segment return. So we don't, uh, the segment is unchanged here. We're just jumping to offset 5d5. So there are two types of inputs that we're gonna supply. One is 10, right? This is gonna basically give us uh, one extra byte of overflow for each 10 that we have. And the other is regular data, by, uh, data bytes. So um, it could be don't cares or it could be the end here. So to encode the new line, all we have to do is input a 10, that's it. Because whenever we write to the file, each 10 here will, will be replaced with a, uh, will, will be appended with a re carriage return. And then for all the other data, we have to, it, unless it's a don't care, don't care, we're just gonna in this case put zeros, right? Which will obviously be encoded to negative one, right? All hex ones. Uh, but uh, what we're going to do is take the value and then we're going to do a, inversion, so as you can see, that's what we're doing here, and then conversion to the decimal. So we're just going, uh, if you do this in the calculator, you can just use the decimal field here to see what you're gonna write. So in this case, we're tur returning to 5d5. This is the word, or the last word. And, um, and then what's gonna happen is uh, we're going to invert this and then get negative 1494 as you see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, try this out both locally and uh, on the server. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and run this. So the first thing I'm going to do is run it on DOSBox. So DOSBox is a DOS emulation program uh, for Windows. Uh, I'm sure it's also available on other operating systems, but Essentially, it's just a, it's literally just DOS. And what we're going to do is execute this program, but we're not going to, we're gonna redirect the output to a file. So the reason why is, I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and run the program first. So here's DOS for fun, exe. So it, again, it prompts for user ID, we're gonna put capture the flag. And then for the 25 serial numbers, we're going to, um, we're gonna execute this payload here. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So 10, 10, 10, 10, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then negative 1494. Okay. And when we do that, we can see that we get the message, wow, how did you manage to get here? Anyway, pull me into the flag. So this is clearly, um, uh, this clearly works on our local machine. And of course, if we do this on the uh, server, it'll also work. I mean, we can go ahead and do that really quickly. So let's go here. Let's go to Ubuntu in the netcat to DOS. Oh, sorry, not netcat, SSH. And what we'll notice here is something really annoying. After we sign in, there's some weird stuff going on. And then it says that blah, blah, blah we can't do this. So uh, the reason why I'm not going to proceed with an exploit script is because we can't use scripts on here, which is, which is, I'm sure you can, but I haven't been, been able to pick it up. Nonetheless, our payloads are completely printable, so it doesn't matter too much. So again, user ID has captured the flag, and then um, we can, however, copy, which is extremely nice. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can see, wow, how did you manage to get here? Anyway, call me and read the flag and then we get it closed. Okay, so very cool. Now let's actually exploit the service. So 
what we want to do obviously is write shell code. Um, well, actually, this may not be obvious, uh, but what we're going to try is to write shell code. Uh, unfortunately, there's no such thing as uh, stack protection in 16 bit DOS. In other words, we can jump to anywhere in memory that we desire, right? It's not even just a matter of whether the stack itself is executable. We can jump anywhere we want. However, there is a complication, and that is to jump to the stack, we need to perform uh, what's called an intersegment branch. So if you look at the image here, we essentially have the code segment. This contains all the executable code. But we may also, uh, the stack segment and the data segment and the extra segment may be different from the code segment. In this case, there's no way for us to jump to the stack without, without changing the segment as well, or else we're just going to loop back uh, relative to this uh, address. So we'll need to perform an intersegment branch. And obviously, um, if we're doing a stack-based uh, exploit, it's going to have to be an intersegment return or a far return, red F. So segments uh, on the same machine, but on different runs, are going to be typically constant. But between machines, they're not necessarily going to be the same. And I'm going to demonstrate this. So we need to first leak the segment addresses before we can develop our actual exploit. So to leak these segments, what we're going to do uh, is uh, call printf on a location in memory. So luckily for us, there is a percent %64s literal, string literal, in the data section. This is uh, used with fgets, but we'll use it with printf. Uh, and our argument will be a location in memory. And specifically, what location? It's going to be uh, this extra segment field that's saved in the beginning of this program. So you can see this is uh, this location here is only hex 14 above the entry point. So this is done very early on. What the uh, what the entry point does is basically save the segments, or save in particular the extra segment, which is actually equal to the data segment, um, uh, into a location in the data uh, segment of this actual running image. And we also know that the code segment will be hex 10 above the data segment. And this is because the uh, there is an allocation for the PSP or the program program segment prefix uh, block. So this is very similar to like a puts um, exploit for a general like uh, ROP or red to lib C uh, that you can um, see in my other exploit videos. So what the program actually does is modify ES and DS to something different, but interestingly, it sets it equal all equal to the stack segment. So in other words, data is the same segment as the stack. Um, but it does relocate uh, relative to CS. And what do we mean by relocation? Essentially, there is a, uh, we can have relocatable code that allows us to you know, execute code anywhere in the program. And this is done by changing a particular address in the actual code uh, uh, code section. And in this case, there's one relocation at the very beginning. I'm not showing it here, but that's what happens. So, but in any case, we need to leak. Um, we need to leak the extra seg segment that's saved at the very beginning. Okay. So, continuing on, um, we're going to also show now uh, how to leak the segments. So, to leak the segments, we're going again to return to printf uh, with arguments of this format string here and and hex 90, which is the offset from the data segment that points to the saved extra segment. So here, uh, really extra segment is uh, hex 90. Okay. So, uh, and you can see that in this buffer as well. And after that, we're going to cleanly exit by returning to the start uh, right after the main call. So, uh, and what happens there is, is just a call to exit with the exit code set by main, so very straightforward. So here's what we want our buffer to look like, and this is the uh, encoded payload. And one thing I would like to point out is that we're going this time. We're actually going to redirect our output to a file uh, because it's very hard to deduce what the values are from the printed garbage characters on the screen. All right, so let's um, demonstrate this. 
So we're going to first demonstrate it locally, and then we're going to demonstrate it uh, online. So first, what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to pipe the output to the binary file. Um, and and the, the problem with this is we won't be able to see the output, uh, which is too bad. But um, but we'll know exactly where we are because there's not that many inputs to consider anyways. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to enter. So now it's probably asking us for user ID, capture the flag. Now it's going to ask us for the 25 serial numbers. In this case, we have, um, oh, by the way, uh, in this case, you see we have a lot more tins because we need to overflow a lot more in the buffer compared to up here. Uh, originally, we only needed to overflow four bytes. Now we need to overflow um, 10 bytes. So you'll see we have 10 tens. Okay, returning to our DOS box here. So let's put 10 tens, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then um, how many zeros here? Uh, well, there's 10 tens, and then there's four values, so that's 14. Uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, four, five. Yeah, so that's 11, yeah, zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, now let's put negative 10, 665, uh, negative 345, uh, negative 436, um, and negative 145. Okay, so as you can see, we successfully returned Right, even though we definitely did not, um, definitely that uh, we uh, followed a different pathway than we're supposed to. But we can now hex dump this file. Um, let's just open up in IDA, it doesn't matter too much. So, as you can see, it was written here, and we're going to load it up into IDA. So, let's do that. We're going to load it with interactive disassembler. Okay, so as you can see now, we have our output. So we did we do see here user ID prompt, enter 25 serial numbers, and then the keys, blah blah blah, encrypted crap. And then after this, we see a 64, or hopefully what is yeah, it is a 64, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's a 64 byte print. And what we're printing is all this stuff here. And then at the end here, what we have is um, a 192. So this means that this uh, original extra segment, uh, and which is equal to the data segment, is equal to hex 192 on our local machine. Okay? So that uh, basically that's the way we leak that. We can also do this on the server so but in this case we need to use t t essentially just redirects the output but also allows us to see it on the screen which is nice and we're going to put it into a file here let's just call it um dos or fun dot bin okay so again we're gonna be asked for that we're gonna do capture the flag and then for our 25 serial numbers we're just going to copy it this time. So, oops, I don't know what that is about. Um, okay, so you notice immediately that we have a print of this weird character. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and hex dump the file now. So hex dump uh, dos for fun dot bin. Uh, and to make it easier to read, you can add a, a dash c. So what you can see here is we have all the garbage uh, from the site when we first enter. Uh, the program actually starts here. We can see actually what we entered as well. But more importantly, we can see that after we get the uh, FP is not valid, we get this block here. And exactly here is where we see um, our segment. So 3A5 is essentially the segment. And we can kind of compare that with what we had. We have 192, 
right? So it, it is quite different, right? And um, I guess one way to approach this would be to just spray sh or write shellcode in just like brute force and kind of guess when you get it. But uh, it's much better to to just uh, to just be sure of jumping to the right location. Uh, another interesting thing is here we have a hex five, and if we open up the original uh, program binary, which I have here, oops, it's been with. So if we open here. Um, and go to the B segment. We can see that after our saved um, extra segment, we have the DOS version. So whereas in the local version, we had our local, uh, yeah, local run, we had the DOS version. I'm oh, sorry, that's not from the local run. This is from the local run. Uh, we had that the version is five, so DOS version five. Um, on the remote version, we have that it's DOS version 7, which I actually didn't know existed, but anyway, uh, good to know. Okay, so after we have this information, um, uh, it's kind of simple now because what we have to do is write shellcode. So again, after we leak the segments, we want to retf to shellcode. So we know that the saved uh, we know the saved extra segment address. So to find the stack segment address, what we need to do is first add 10, right? Because um, the relocation hex 30A is relative to the original CS, which is originally ES plus 10. And then we need to find a Rediff gadget, uh, which is a far return gadget, which is actually not that hard to find. Um, it's just a single byte, so very easy. And then that allows us to set CS and IP because we can just write values to the stack. So a good question is what should IP be? We obviously know that CS should be set to SS, which is this value here, but what should IP be? Well, we know that main always starts with BP equals FF of six. You can actually prove this by looking through the entry point. And therefore the checker function starts with FF B2, right? You can also prove this just by looking at the main function. So the buffer where our actual decoded input goes is BP minus X32, which is XF of 80. So if we want to return to our shellcode, we will first need to overflow the buffer, which means that we'll have a couple of 10 words here. Um, and in particular, we'll need eight. Uh, we'll need eight uh, of these 10 words, right? Um, unlike here, actually, we needed 10 because we uh, first, we need to overflow this, and then we needed four extra words. But here, we only need three extra words because we need the redf gadget, the offset, and the segment to return to. And thus, this will get translated to 24 bytes. So we need to actually return to f 8 And this is encoded as 103. Okay, so now for our shell code, we essentially need to only do three tasks. First is to open the flag file, then read the file, and then print its contents. Not that difficult, right? Uh, however, there's not a lot of room to do this, right? Because we need three words uh, to have the RENF gadget with our segment and offset for IP and, and um, CS. Um, and then we need eight uh, for, those, for the overflow in the first place. So that leaves us with 28 bytes. So not a lot, but should be sufficient on 16-bit machine. Um, and to speed this up a little bit, we know that the flag screen is actually uh, prepared for us in the data section because this is the user ID. So here is my uh, shell code. Uh, I know it's probably not the most efficient one you can come up with, uh, but it's very straightforward. So what happens first is uh, 80, hex 80 is subtracted from SP. And the reason I do this is because um, I want to uh, ensure that whenever we're actually running our shell code, we don't uh, inadvertently override it, right? Because our stack and our code is in the same place. Next, I want to move the location of the flag string into DX. And then I want to prepare for a system call to open the file. In this case, the lower, lowest eight bytes of the a, AX register uh, represents the permissions. So I want to read and I want it to be uh, compatible with sharing. So in this case, I don't really care about AL, I'll just set it to zero. My AH is hex 3D to represent the uh, read, or sorry, the open system call. 
after I open the file, um, AX will have the uh, the file handle, uh, of course, assuming that um, there's no error. And then I move that into BX to prepare for the next system call, which is a read file. CX here will be set to 128. This is arbitrary. You can set it to anything you want to, um, as long as it's long enough to actually print the flag. Uh, but in this case, I, I set it to hex 80, and then I move hex 3F into AH. So this is the syscall number, or it's the N21 uh, argument for read file. After that, um, Oh, and by the way, notice I didn't set DX explicitly. So what this will actually do is um, write uh, is read the file exactly into the end of uh, starting here at the flag. And the reason I do this is obviously there's no point to right. I mean I don't have that much room on the stack, so uh, so I'm not going to to uh, to really care about where this information is going to be dumped. And then I'll I'll just print the character buffer starting to DX the file. And here's my final system call. So as you can see, this is the encoded um, encoded payload. So we have here eight new lines, right? That will give us the overflow that we need. The overflow actually is here. And then here is my shell code. Um, and notice at the end here, I have a negative one. Uh, that's just because I didn't really use, so you can see here there's 25 bytes, but I really have 28. So this is just kind of a padding uh, padding byte. But really what will happen is this will go uh, go into BP. Uh, when the vulnerable function returns. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Um, and I'm only going to run this on the remote machine because these values here are for the remote machine. But if I did want to run it on the local machine, I could as well. So uh, again, the shellcode is here. Here is the retf gadget. Here is the encoded offset, which I mentioned here um, is going to be FF98, and then here's the segment, uh, encoded segment, which I leaked from the first um, uh, payload. Okay, so let's go ahead and take this, and okay, and then copy it, and then I'm going to go ahead and run without um, typing into that file. So after the flag, and then we're going to input our 25 serial numbers. Oops, and it looked like it already oh, in it. Okay, so we got it closed here. But you can see the flag is exactly printed here. We also got a lot of other garbage on the stack, and you recognize a lot of these strings from uh, from the data section uh, here. Um, and this is, of course, expected, because uh, if we look at the documentation uh, for uh, in hex 9, we can see that it will stop only at the terminator, which uh, for a DOS string is the dollar sign. So that's very strange, um, but uh, that's what happens. Okay, so that is the exploit. Um, and so here's the flag. Um, so just some concluding remarks. Uh, so this challenge obviously demonstrates that new line is annoying especially the differences that, uh, difference between the implementations of different machines um, is annoying. And, uh, uh, but even worse, it could be buggy, right? Uh, we, completely, we use it to completely exploit the service here. Um, and another way to attack this binary is actually to try to spawn a shell, much like we do bin, uh, system or executive BSH on a Linux machine. And in DOS, it works a little bit differently. What you have to do is um, is you have to execute a program, so in this case, command.com, um, and you have to pass it a properly constructed parameter block, which basically gives it the command line arguments, as well as the environment, and a couple of other, uh, a little bit of other information. So I actually did implement this attack. Um, however, this does require chaining multiple expectations. It's just not possible to set up the parameter block and do everything in just one go. So what you actually need to do is and you're, you need to break up the shell code, uh, and obviously in, in ways that you can pick up after uh, after leaving, right? Um, in other words, you can't really expect your registers to be preserved. You need to store them in memory, and and then you need to end uh, each exploitation with this set of instructions, which basically restores the stack pointer, and then does a far 
jump or far branch to main. And then you can basically run the exploit multiple times. Um, but again, uh, this actually doesn't work because on the server, there is no search file command.com. Uh, if you try to do this and you can debug it, uh, you'll see that there is no such file. Unfortunate, but um, but yeah, uh, it, I guess it is simpler to do it uh, to to just read the file. Uh, but most importantly, DOS exploitation is super cool, and so is 16-bit um, software. So with that, uh, that concludes the um, DOS for fun challenge. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, please.